Digital Literacy, Appearances of Art, Part 2. We're going to pick up here where we left off, um, acquiring vocabulary to describe what we're seeing. And just as a reminder, we're trying to be able to put words to our vision for ourselves, to clarify our own thoughts, to be able to communicate what we see to others, and to be able to provide an accurate analysis or an accurate critique of the artworks that we're experiencing. We've already begun the visual elements by discussing line, shape, figure, ground, and form and space. And so we're going to pick up here with light and color. Now we're sometimes helpfully reminded about the importance of light when it comes to looking at artworks by certain three-dimensional works. So this work by Fred Eertekens uh, is very playful in how it uses light. If we just look at the three-dimensional form, it looks just uh, kind of a scribble. Um, but then when we see the way that the shadow is cast on the wall and it actually per, uh, creates this word or these phrases, we're reminded of, of how wonderful that relationship between light and shadow can be in an artwork. If you're looking at a three-dimensional form or a work of architecture, lighting has such incredible power to really transform the whole space. So when we look at this building, which might be kind of surprising in its exterior form, um, it's an unusual building that might remind us of uh, a farmhouse, a silo. Um, I've heard it described as perhaps like a park uh, community center. Um, but it's actually, if we look at the interior shot, you'll probably notice right away, it's actually a cathedral. Uh, this design by Le Corbusier was really meant to maximize the, the way that light can create a sense of sacredness or holiness, provide a space for contemplation. So light can definitely transform a space, a place, an artwork for us. When we're talking about uh, a sense of lighting, which is of course an illusion in a two-dimensional work, we would call that value. So value is the quality of light or dark in a two-dimensional work. And oftentimes we'll have a value scale like here on the left. Um, we would call high value the lighter range and low value would be the darker range. And very typically, beginning art students will begin with their paints or their charcoals by drawing such a value scale to get to know the precise value range. We also have a number system assigned to this value range. We usually start with 1 as the lightest value and 10 as the darkest value. Um, so sometimes you might hear someone describe the value in that number sense. They might say it uses a lot of 1s and 5s or it really uses a lot of 7s to 9s um, to describe how they're seeing the value in a work. The image on the right, the diagram, reminds us of just how simple but magical the use of value can be. So you can take a flat circle and just by juxtaposing lighter and darker values, uh, create this sense of form and space in this uh, circle that has now become a sphere. The shadow and the cast shadow, of course, help us to believe that it's a three-dimensional form. If you uh, like drawing, or if you haven't tried any drawing before, it would be worth pausing here and see if you can draw a sphere, make a, a circle, a flat circle, appear to be a three-dimensional sphere, just with simple use of value. These are two images that give us uh, a lot of focus on the play of value. These two photographs by Robert, Robert Maplethorpe are just black and white, so we can see the value without the complexity of color. And on the left, we would say he's using really um, mid-tone values, very soft contrast between the light and the dark values, um, where this African-American man has kind of a soft light on him and a, a kind of a neutral gray background. So it's very soft contrast. Um, by contrast, on the left, or sorry, on the right, we have the portrait of Isabel, Isabella Rossellini. And here it's much more high contrast. So her pale skin and the, the light on the skin is really contrasting dark, uh, highly with the black background and her black hair and outfit. So that would be a high contrast of value. Of course, light and our experience of light begets color, and it was in the late 1600s that Sir Isaac Newton, experimenting as a scientist, was able to understand that it's light that gives us our sense of color. So his experiment was to pass white light, sunlight, through a prism, 
And when it came out, it broke into this range of colors, this spectrum of colors that we see as, you know, the, the rainbow assortment from red to violet. Now, of course, some other animals and, and other life forms can actually see beyond that into what we'd call ultraviolet rays or infrared rays on either side of that spectrum. But we as humans get to see this array of colors. When we're thinking about color mixing as artists, we're aware of there's two types of systems. Most of you have probably some point in your life, maybe not since elementary school, but at some point you have worked with subtractive color mixing. And that's color mixing where you're using pigments like uh, crayons, pastels, most likely paint. The more colors you mix with paint, you might remember, the more you get closer to sort of a brownish or dark gray or toward a black. And it's, we call it subtractive because the more you add together, the farther you get from white light. As opposed to Newton's experiment where he was working with light, and the more colors that add together, it actually combines, recombines to create white light. So he took that prism, passed the colored spectrum through it, and again arrived back at the pure white light. So if you're working on computers or with photography or with film, you're actually using what we call the additive color mixing, which is, is exemplified here on the right. Now, color theory is actually still an open-ended science. We don't have explanations for all of the colors and the ways that they interact, which is a pretty exciting idea, actually, that it's still yet to be fully discovered and understood. But generally, we use a 12-point color wheel to get a handle on how colors relate to one another. Um, here in this color wheel, we have a good uh, arrangement that helps us to understand some of the relationships. So, all, each color that is here marked with the number one, like the yellow, the red, and the blue, are marked with the number one so that we can remember that they are what we call primary colors. Primary colors, in theory, are three colors that can, from which you can mix any other color, but that can't be mixed themselves. So there's no two things you can mix together to arrive at yellow or arrive at red or blue. But with these three, red, yellow, and blue, you, in theory, can arrive at every other color. The secondaries are colors mixed from the primaries. So here we have the orange marked with the number two, the green, and the violet. And of course you remember that red and yellow make orange. Uh, yellow and blue help you to arrive at green, and then blue and red arrive at violet. So those secondaries marked with the number two are the direct product of primaries. And then you might have guessed that all of the colors marked with the number three are what we would call the tertiaries. They are the product of a primary mixed with a secondary. So all of these um, hyphenated names, yellow-green, blue-green, blue-violet, etc. In each of these names, the primary name, like blue, comes before the secondary name, violet. So blue-violet, not violet-blue. So those are the primaries, secondaries, and tertiaries. <clears throat> Some other interesting qualities of color that we want to be familiar with, or terms that we use for color, the first one would be hue. And for most of us, when we say color, or we say something like, oh, I like the color of your shirt, we usually mean hue, which is the color family name. So yellow is a hue, red is a hue, etc. Value, again, is the lightness or darkness. So you might have a light yellow versus a dark yellow, and that would be the value range within that hue. The third characteristic of color is saturation. And whereas value is the lightness, saturation has to do with the brightness. It is the um, continuum of a full-bodied pure color um, to the other extent of the continuum would be gray. So full color to a neutralized gray. Um, value and saturation can be often confused. Just try to remember that value is lightness, the difference between black and white, um, versus saturation being the brightness, the distance between purity and uh, desaturated gray. Okay. Lastly, at the bottom of our list here on the right, there's a few color relationships that can be helpful to be aware of. One is called the complementary relationship. Complementary colors are opposites on the color wheel. Um, for instance, red and green here, or yellow and violet, blue and orange, and even the uh, going across from tertiaries would also be complementary relationships. 
compliments tend to be very uh, feisty partners. So, you know, that red and green, they really kind of bounce off of each other. Physically, the reason is because they are representing opposite sides of the spectrum from each other. And if you add those two colors together, they will help you arrive back at that white light if you're looking at the um, additive light theory. Um, you can also look at a lot of sports teams will use this color combination. The blue and the orange is popular, even violet and yellow or violet and gold, because they do really stand out from each other. They're very vivid. We might say um, also that if you notice, we have kind of a warm uh, color, uh, warm colors on the left-hand side of the wheel, and what we would describe as more cool colors toward the right side of this wheel. And when you're looking at complementary colors, you often have a warm pit against a cool. So the warm being the orange, and the cool being the blue, or the warm being the red, and the cool being the green. Um, so that's another part of that fieriness, that kind of love-hate relationship between the complementary colors. Another color scheme would be analogous colors. Analogous colors are any two to four colors that are next to each other on the color wheel. So analogous is any two to four colors that are next to each other on the wheel. So if you saw a painting that used yellows, yellow oranges, and oranges, um, that would be an analogous composition. And analogous compositions or analogous schemes, color schemes, tend to be very soothing for our eyes since there's not a high contrast or high clash between the colors. It tends to be very easy to look at, um, very even-handed between the different colors. And they generally wouldn't have that warm, cold uh, contrast, right, since they're next to each other on the wheel. The last color scheme to take note of here is monochromatic. And you might guess just from the word that mono meaning single and chroma meaning color. It's a color scheme where they're using only one hue, but variations in value or saturation within that hue. So if you look at an image that is all orange, but uses lighter and darker oranges, that would be monochromatic. Let's look at a few examples and see if we can name the color schemes being used in them. This first one by Aaron Douglas. What do we think? It is, in fact, analogous. You could also describe it as using a lot of cool colors. So it's kind of got some violets, blue violets, just a touch into the greens. So analogous, very even, easy to look at, not too jarring for your eyes. This image by Pablo Picasso would be monochromatic, right? Because it's just in the hue of blue that uses a range of values within blue, light to dark. This image by Renoir is a little more complex, but we'd say, especially in the foreground figures, we're very aware of the red of her bonnet, the yellow of his hat, and the deep blue of his suit. So I'd say overall I'm aware of a very primary color scheme here, right? The red, yellow, and blue that are our primary colors. And this one, this image by Sandy Skoglund, is definitely using those complementary colors, right? So you see that vivid orange, that very hot, warm orange, pitted against the very cool, although intense, blue. And so you have this hot, cold contrast of the complementary colors. Very vivid, and in this case, very fantastic. One other visual phenomenon I want to put on our map is that of optical mixing. And this is when an artist, instead of mixing the colors fully on his palette or his or her palette, um, they actually put the colors onto the canvas, not fully mixed, so that they will mix in our eyes. But when you're up close to the image, you can actually see the separate colors being used. Um, just one artist who's used this effect is Chuck Close, who um, you can see in the full image on the right that when standing from a distance and, and even from a greater distance the image really kind of blends together and feels uh, fairly photorealistic actually the greater distance you are as you get closer and closer and you see the detail on the left you actually begin to see that he's actually using some very cold blues in some of the shadows some very hot reds um, some surprising oranges and even yellows throughout. And so it's called optical mixing because the colors mix in our eyes, right, rather than being mixed on the palette and fully blended on the composition. <coughs> oh. 
So moving on to our principles of design. Let's look uh, at some of these images. Well, the first would be an example of symmetrical balance. Symmetrical balance is a type of balance in which the left and right hand sides of the composition have an equal visual weight. Right? Symmetry means that left and right sides have an equal visual weight. It does not have to be a mirror image from the left to the right side, but a similar visual weight. So in this image, it is a little bit more of a mirrored image. This uh, self-portrait called Two Fridas by Frida Kahlo, where she's placed herself in two different um, costumes, her native costume and then her more Western uh, attire, and is kind of exploring the different sides of herself. But even in this image by Vermeer called Woman Holding a Balance from the Baroque era, it actually is still symmetrically balanced, even though it's not as much of a mirror image as we saw with Frida Kahlo. So for instance, if we look at kind of the shape of the woman, and especially her dark jacket here, that's generally a triangular sort of shape. And then we look over here in the shadow, another triangular shape against the wall, right? Um, this painting in the background creates a nice horizontal or sorry vertical dividing line between the left and the right. So even though this right hand side is more uh, dark in value and the left hand side is a little more lighter in value, it still is very evenly dispersed. So this would actually be symmetrical balance. We tend to see a lot of symmetry being used in architecture. It tends to be very stabilizing, very welcoming, and also can be fairly authoritative. So the image on the left is of uh, St. Peter's Cathedral in the Vatican in Rome. On the right, the Taj Mahal in India. But if you think about the White House, most of the buildings across campus, most banks that you go to, use a lot of symmetry because it feels stable, authoritative, um, kind of classic, really, coming from the, the ancient Greeks. Now, asymmetry <clears throat> is still a form of good balance. It's not the difference between symmetry and asymmetry is not balanced and imbalanced. Asymmetry just means that the from left to right side of the composition has a distinct visual weight, right? Still a sense of wholeness and balance, but a distinct visual weight from the left to the right. So this image by Whistler, the arrangement in black and gray, which is also sometimes called portrait of his mother, um, gives us a good sense of asymmetry where there's distinct shapes, more organic shape of her body toward the center and right side of the composition and the more geometric uh, rectilinear curtain hanging on the left side of the canvas. Or this image that we've looked at several times would also be asymmetry since the, the human forms in the foreground on the right have a different visual weight than the open walkway on the left hand side of the composition. <coughs> Another uh, principle we want to be aware of is economy and simplicity. So this image, or sorry, economy and simplicity versus what we're going to see is complexity. So here we have a good example of economy, meaning they're not using a lot of different elements, right? Keeping it very simple, we might say minimal. Not simplistic, which tends to be a negative term, but simplified, or you might say austere. This image by Fred Sambach, where he's using um, just thin wire to create these rectangles that sort of hover just above the ground. They are open forms. You could actually walk through them. And they delineate the space of the room without blocking us off. They're very rectilinear, simplified forms as opposed to this image, also linear in quality, but much more complex, um, tangled, web-like by Tomas Saraceno. Or in these two portraits or, or figures, we have on the left a very economic use of elements, whereas on the right, this portrait uses much more complexity, much more detailing, much more sense of movement. And both can be good things, just depending on the context and what the artist wants to convey. If you're really trying to, in this case with a portrait, if you're really trying to show a specific person from their specific era, um, you might choose the more complex image on the right, where you're given details of his armor, 
um, given a sense of his hairstyling even, or the sense of movement as if he's being windswept. But you really feel like you could recognize that person on the street. Whereas on the left, Brancusi giving us the sleeping muse, he's trying to give us a more ethereal, more um, generalized form because a muse, which is a figure of inspiration, might be different for each of us. So he doesn't want to be too detailed and, and make it so that we can't all relate to it. Right? So economy and complexity can both be useful in their own way. Repetition is another principle of design. So here on the left, we have an image that does not use repetition. It's a solitary image of Marilyn Monroe in an image made by Andy Warhol. But Warhol also did several Marilyn images where he did use repetition, like this. And understand that there's a very uh, distinct purpose in using one or the other. So in the solitary image on the left, um, we're more aware of her as a unique person or unique icon. Um, it should even remind us of medieval images of the Madonna um, and Christ child, right? Where the gold background almost feels royal or regal or heavenly. And so Warhol is in one way saying that Marilyn in this left-hand image is sort of the icon of the day or sort of a deity within that culture, right? But on the right, we become aware that she's not so unique. She is a Xerox of a Xerox. And we might even start realizing that um, this image is really kind of a flat, abstracted image. It doesn't have the subtlety of like soft contours across her face or really even naturalistic coloring. And so we have the sense that Perhaps it's fame um, that can actually make a person less of an individual, right? And they just become sort of a copy of a copy. Right? Repetition also has a way of creating rhythm. So our eye naturally starts to have a pace where we jump from one similar form to the other. It can also, in this case, by um, this image by Magdalena Abakanowicz, gives us the sense of almost an army of people or a, a large group of people, and that really changes the emotional sensibility of the work. If you can imagine a singular um, sculpture, in this case, versus this multitude, how with the multitude it becomes not just about an individual experience, but the experience of perhaps a whole people, a whole race, something like that. Another principle of design would be unity and variety. And these principles are, come, in, come together and are sort of held in tension with one another. Now we tend to like a lot of variety. We want our eyes to be interested. We don't want to get bored by too much repetition, too much of the same. However, if everything is constantly changing in an artwork, then you really lack unity and it might feel like all the pieces don't actually belong together. So unity is the sense that all the pieces are in conversation, that they're building up toward one whole piece. But variety keeps it interesting. So here in this piece by Ben Jones, the unity is created through the repetition of similar forms, the faces and the hands that are approximately the same size. <coughs> <coughs> but the variety is, of course, built in through the variety of patterns, the changing colors across the arms and faces. Unity and variety here, again with Da Vinci's Last Supper. There's unity in the architectural space. The, the balance here, the symmetry, creates a sense of unity. The fact that um, the foreground is filled with these uh, 13 figures that are all approximately the same size and in a similar color range. However, the variety is in the different hand gestures, different postures, different facial expressions um, among the different disciples and Christ. Texture is very important to take note of. It's something that the artist is certainly conscious of. Um, and it's one of the things that is most difficult to experience when you're doing online learning or even book learning. Um, texture is one of those things that you really get to experience most fully when you're seeing, especially with paintings and sculptures, when you're seeing them in person. Um, here, Frank Arbach is intentionally building up a lot of grisly, kind of sensuous but scabby uh, texture in this portrait um, where you're very aware of if you ran, ran your hand across it, it would be uh, bumpy and, and maybe even like uh, sharp in some places. So that was actual texture. Here we have visual texture. Paintings by James Rosenquist tend to be actually very flat and refined, a very smooth surface 
texturally, like if you ran your hand across it, it'd be very, very smooth. However, he's giving us visual texture here where we actually believe um, that there's this kind of cellophane across the face of this doll, or we believe that there's she's got hair that would have a texture underneath the cellophane. So visual texture rather than actual texture is, is very much at play in this image. One of our last principles would be that of proportion. Um, scale and proportion are two terms that usually go hand in hand that have to do with the size of an artwork, but not just the size um, as a flat figure, but really about the relationship of size, relationship of scale. Um, one idea in, in terms of applying the idea of proportions is the relationship of parts to the whole. So the small shapes, and brush strokes within a painting to the whole of it. But we can also see that relationship of proportions when we think about the relationship of the artwork to the viewer. So what does it feel like to stand in front of this work? Um, this is another aspect that we often lose when we're doing online learning or book learning and that you really get to experience when you're standing in front of a work. And it can be so, so important. This image here is one by Klaus Oldenburg where he's very playfully taken something that we're used to being very tiny, you know, just three inches big. It's a clothespin that we're used to using as a utilitarian form, right? And not thinking of as an art form at all. And here he's made it, I'm not sure how many feet tall, several stories tall, so that it actually towers above us. Um, he's also sort of playing a joke here on us because he knows that utilitarian forms are not usually considered artwork. But by making it so huge into this ginormous uh, statue, um, he's actually made it non-utilitarian and therefore it becomes an artwork. So he's kind of teasing us a little bit about that boundary between utilitarian forms and fine art forms. So the relationship of the viewer is one way to apply proportions. Another way to apply the idea of proportions is to look at the relationship between the work and its environment. So here again we've got Michelangelo's David that is currently housed at the Academia in Florence. And it has really a beautiful, very clean, crisp um, environment. You can see here that the, you know, the people, the viewers can come and stand at the base of its pedestal. It has this beautiful dome above it that lets in sunlight during the day and, and just kind of showers this white marble in this beautiful sunlight. And the rest of the environment is very controlled and kind of a quiet, uh, visually quiet environment. What's interesting to look at too, though, is that the David was actually designed to be outside. Its uh, original position was here outside the Palazzo della Signoria, um, at the Uffizi in Florence. And this is um, a palace that is now an art museum. And here is where the original David stood. It's now replaced by a, um, a replica that is the same size, approximately 17 feet tall. So it was made to be in, seen in conjunction with other statues. If you look to the right, it has a, a sort of a partner on the other side of the doorway. But then over here to the right is an outside arcade with another 15 different sculptures and then actually other, other places in the open piazza. There are several more figures. So it was meant to be seen in kind of conversation with those figures. If you look at this image on the left, you can see that it was also the smoothness of the marble was also going to be contrasted with the roughness of the, um, the stone of the building. And then this distance view lets us see why the, the size of the image was so big that he needed to make it at least seven feet tall so that it could really stand out. So that when you see it from the distance between these two buildings and compared to the clock tower and, and bell tower above it, it still has a presence in that space. So those proportions are really significant to the artist in desi designing and deciding why an image needs to be as big or as small as it is. Sometimes in general we could say that larger images do tend to be obviously seen better able to be seen from a distance and they can almost make one feel inferior to them. They might feel very grand and sort of magnificent if they're very large. If an image is very small and it really beckons you to come close in order to be able to see it, kind of imagine an image that might be only two or three inches big. That is an image that wants to sort of create an intimacy between the viewer and itself. It forces you to come close to that near proximity. So let's look at this image um, and see if we can apply these different elements and principles that we've just talked about. Take just a moment on your own to think how any of these different words that we've talked about apply here. If 
we start at the top of our list with light, thinking about the value quality, we would describe this as having high value contrast. There's very bold whites, very dark blacks, so high contrast of value. We could point out that the light source seems to be coming from the left, casting shadows toward the right. In terms of color, the hues are pretty minimal. There's uh, reds, some warm yellows, some warm browns, but none of really the cool side of the spectrum, no blues, greens, no real violets. In terms of saturation, the red is fairly saturated. We're aware that it probably feels like almost a, a velvet fabric that he's wearing. Um, and so there's a richness, a purity to that red in certain places. But then as we go into the shadows, he uses desaturation as well as darker value to give a sense of that shadow and the, the stillness of the background. Unity and variety. Uh, overall, because it's... Uh, an image with just one figure in it. He's very centrally placed. It's an eight, or sorry, a symmetrical balance of the figure so centrally placed. Overall, it is a very unified image. But there is a bit of variety and dynamic movement created through the undulating fabric, right? The folds in the fabric going across the image. Um, in terms of economy and complexity, there's actually both in different ways. We could again say that the economy is that it's a singular figure centrally placed and taking up most of the picture plane, but the complexity is in the detailing of his, uh, of his costuming, of his robes and his uh, medals going across his chest. Even in the carpet at the bottom of the image it's, is more complex. And then proportions. The fact that he does take up the whole of the image um, gives us a sense of his grandeur. It is a, a fairly large painting, and so the relationship to the viewer is one that he does feel very kingly. This is Napoleon enthroned by, by Aang. And so he does feel very um, authoritative in this posture. Now we want to add to our practice of, of putting words to what we see by also actually putting an image to what we see. We're going to do some sketching. And some of you might already have had some art experiences where you feel fairly comfortable with drawing. Some of you maybe not at all. And my expectations are, um, are not that you're going to produce uh, highly refined drawings or anything like a photorealistic work. I just want you to do a simple sketch or even think of it as a diagram where you're just practicing getting to know an image by visual means. So think of it as sort of, you know, we all sing along to our favorite songs or perhaps drum along to our favorite songs, even if we're tone deaf or are not very rhythmically gifted. Um, so think about this as sort of singing along, even if you are tone deaf. Um, keep in mind that we're going to keep it very, very simple and that it's the process, not the product that matters. So it's just a good way to get to know an image. This is something that I do when I go to museums. I take a sketchbook with me and I'll sit in front of a, a painting or a sculptural or a photograph and just do some sketches just so I can better take in the image, how it's working together, all the different facets of it. So here's the process I'm going to recommend. Um, start on an open sheet of paper, unlined sheet of paper, preferably in pencil, but you may also use pen. And start by diagramming the external boundaries of the frame. So if it's a tall rectangle, start with that form. If it happens to be a circular image, start with that circle. Try to get about the, the right proportions. Sketch in a vertical and a horizontal axis right down the center. This is going to help you to measure where things should be placed, if they should be in the top left quadrant, the bottom right quadrant. If you happen to be working on a very, very large image, if you're in a museum and you're looking at something that is the size of a whole wall, you know, 25 feet long, you might want to even put additional axes in there to help break it down and keep the scale approximately correct. Once you've done that, observe the lines and shapes that are in the image. And again, simplify. So don't worry about all the facial features. Simplify the head to a circle, that kind of thing. And then you're going to begin placing those lines and shapes on the page. Think about how close to the edge should it be, how close to the center should it be, just to approximate the placement. This is the kind of image you might end up with. This is just a, a five-minute sketch, not being too careful. Um, 
If you are somewhat of a perfectionist, you might actually want to start by sketching in pen and not giving yourself the option of erasing. I know some of us who are very perfectionistic, we kind of paralyze ourselves and we go back and erase and erase and erase. And I want you to be able to enjoy this process, uh, focusing on the process, not the product. So if that's you, start with pen so that you can't be tempted toward erasing over and over again. Um, I'm thinking that you might spend up to 15 minutes sketching on one of these. So it's not an all-day affair, again, not photorealism, just kind of a loose sketch to get you familiar with the image to help you identify some of the shapes, the balance, the proportions. So try this. Maybe pause the video here, get out a clean sheet of paper, and spend a few minutes diagramming this image, Napoleon Enthroned. Be sure to check your online journal assignment after this lecture, and, and then I'll see you for the next lesson.